everybody. Thank you guys all for joining us tonight. Uh, we've got a jam-packed series. We've actually got three meet and greets for this evening, and you guys are joining us for the very first that we're going to be having. Um, so thank you for making some time tonight to hear from local candidates about their plans for climate action in London um, and at the federal level. Of course, we know real action on climate change and biodiversity loss has never been more important, which is why we wanted to pull together an event where you could hear from candidates. Um, and it will be recorded and shared afterwards. So if anyone, you know, if you have a friend or family member who wasn't able to make it, please do share it with them uh, afterwards. And this is actually inspired and part of the 100 debates for the environment, which is a series of events run by Green Pack, and we're hoping to be part of 100 debates going across Canada. So tonight on our agenda, we're going to be hearing from each candidate about what their climate action plans are and if they are elected. And then we'll also be having a Q&A period afterwards with questions from the audience. So you can see down at the bottom, you have a Q&A feature where you can submit your questions. Uh, after we hear the presentations, we'll be selecting a couple and Leah will be going through those. And also, if you'd like to have closed captions throughout this series, you can just click the live transcript button as well on the bottom. Um, we'd like to start off by acknowledging that we are gathered at, on the, at this event on the traditional grounds of the Anishinaabe, Haudenosaunee, and Lenapawak peoples. And we're currently upriver from Chippewa of the Thames First Nation, Oneida Nation of the Thames, and Muncie Delaware Nation. And we really hope that whoever does get elected makes truth and reconciliation a priority. And our organization commits to continuing working towards making a community that is more resilient, vibrant, and just for all. So if you're just joining us, my name is Skylar. I'm from the London Environmental Network, and we're starting off tonight with London Fanshawe riding. Um, so like I said, we're going to be doing five minutes each for the candidates' climate plans, and we're going to be starting alphabetically by last name. So I'm going to pass it off to Mohamed Hamoud, who is a Liberal candidate for London Fanshawe, and he can share his plans and the Liberal plans for climate action um, for about five minutes before we switch off over to Lindsay. So I will give you the floor now. Thank you very much, Skylar, and thank you for introducing us. And thank you for sharing the acknowledgement uh, that we are on the territory uh, as settlers here. So where I live, where I work, where I play, uh, it's important to remember that the circumstances of our colon, you know, the colonization and uh, to listen to uh, indigenous peoples and to respect and uh, make sure that we're hearing and understanding their perspectives and the perspectives of the peoples of this territory that you mentioned. So thank you very much. And uh, thank you to my colleague, uh, Lindsay, for being here and to everyone who's joining us tonight. So I'd like to start off by saying that, um, you know, we're almost two years into this pandemic and, um, you know, Canadians, I don't think we've collectively paused the question how COVID-19 has brought to light the links between this climate crisis that we are all living and the human impact on nature, as well as the rise of global pandemics like we're experiencing now with COVID, as we experienced before with SARS and Ebola and three quarters of infectious diseases. As scientists agree, COVID originated in other animal species and spread to humans in large part because of the pressures of these species brought, brought on by land changes and unsustainable uh, consumption. These factors are also leading causes of climate change, as you can well agree. And uh, as a parent, I'm very concerned about the type of planet we're leaving behind for our children and future generations. Many people still deny that we're facing a climate crisis. And I know from what I've personally witnessed over the past 40 years I've been in Canada that we have cause for concern. In fact, we're seeing evidence of accelerated climate change with glaciers melting at a faster rate, warmer temperatures, fires, uh, permafrost melting and releasing greenhouse gases into the atmosphere, sea levels rising, threatening coastal communities and ecosystems, and plastics just showing up everywhere in our beautiful seas and lands and oceans. And to me, this climate crisis is very real. So I'm hearing about it. Uh, we talk about it at home, but recently I've been really talking about it at the doors, uh, knocking on doors. I'm sure as Lindsay will share as well. You know, people are telling me that you know, things that I know already that they want governments and their elected officials to do something about this crisis. And I've been listening to these concerns and assuring people in London Fanshawe that our liberal government not only acknowledges the crisis, but has put in place real measures to address it. When we came into government, Canada had protected less than 1% of our oceans. We are now at 14%. We've already protected vast areas of our lands and waters and made a commitment to protect at least 30% of land, fresh water and ocean by 2030. We have protected a landmass equal to three and a half times the size of Nova Scotia. 
We've also made the largest investments in nature conservation in Canadian history. And we have ambitious plans to do even more, including 10 national parks, 10 national marine conservation areas, and 15 national new urban parks. I'm happy to say that the Liberals are committed to the 30% by 2030 target, and we have a proven track record on nature protection to get us there. In fact, the Liberal government has done more to fight climate change than any other government in Canadian history. We've taken significant action to cut pollution. We made sure it was no longer free to pollute anywhere in the country while putting more money in the pockets of Canadians. We're also making it easier to purchase zero emission vehicles with a $5,000 rebate, and we're providing rebates for Canadians to upgrade their homes to be more energy efficient. In brief, we're committed to achieving our 2030 climate, our 2030 climate target of reducing emissions by 40 to 45% of 2005 levels, which is aligned with where science says we need to go and will reach net zero by 2050. We have a plan to help us meet our target. The Liberal government is already committed to and funded over $53 billion towards a green and just pandemic recovery that includes transit projects, home retrofits, training workers so they have the skills to work in zero carbon industries, protecting workers by advancing Canada's first just transition legislation that aims to support local and regional economic diversification uh, strategies and collaboration with local workers, unions, educational institutions, environmental groups, investors, and Indigenous peoples, as well as support, supporting UNDRIP, which would ensure the government of Canada will work in consultation and cooperation with Indigenous peoples. We've also invested in funding Indigenous leadership in nature conservation, expanding the Indigenous guardians programs, as well as set up Indigenous, uh, additional Indigenous protected areas. The best vote for climate change, I'm biased, but it's a vote for the Liberals. The choice is stark. The only path to strong climate action is a re-elected Liberal government. The Conservatives would take us back and roll back climate action while they had 10 years to take action on climate change. They did nothing. Our Liberal government has been working for the past five years with Canadians to develop and implement ambitious climate policy that Conservative politicians challenge us in court, debated over whether climate change was real and tried to drag us down. The NDP proposal would hurt Canadian workers and industries, and according to third-party experts, their plan is ineffective and costly when compared with the Liberals. The NDP got an F, and the Liberal plan got an A-. minus. The NDP plan got a 2 out of 10, while the Liberal plan, described as bold and credible by Andrew Weaver, former head of the Green Party of BC, got an 8 out of 10. The time for taking action to address the climate crisis was years ago. But for, for the past five years, our government has been working with Canadians, and unlike the NDP plan, we won't leave workers behind. As an MP, I will, work, I will push and work with my colleagues to deliver the ambitious new proposals that we have brought forward. More ambition, higher standards, tougher regulations, less pollutions, and more jobs for everyone. Protecting the environment, our health, and our future should not be a partisan issue, and I would gladly work across the aisle to make progress and make progress faster. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mohammed, for sharing those plans. And to answer the question in the chat, yes, he is a Liberal candidate for London Fanshawe. And now I'll be passing it over to Lindsay Matheson, who is the NDP candidate for London Fanshawe, to share her plans and her party plans for climate action over the next five minutes. Thank you. And over to you, Lindsay. Thank you so much, Skylar, and, and thank you to the, the London Environmental Network for putting this on. Uh, it's an important conversation to have, absolutely. Uh, as the, the Member of Parliament for almost two years uh, in, in London Fanshawe, I've been so proud to, to be a part of a caucus that, that truly puts uh, that political courage and that political will behind our desire to impact uh, climate change, to make the changes instead of just talking about it, meeting targets. Um, this summer, of course, we saw uh, such incredible uh, um, horrors and, and temperatures uh, with heat domes and uh, floods and forest fires. And of course, we know that that uh, has an impact on our health on our lives, on our livelihoods, on our economy, and, and we cannot ignore it anymore. We can't just use those pretty words. Um, it is a Canadian's right to ensure that we take this crisis seriously and 
that's what New Democrats are going to do. We know, of course, that the Intergovernmental uh, Panel on Climate Change has outlined that need for urgent ac uh, action uh, to limit glo global temperatures. We need to meet our targets. We need to, of course, meet them faster. And that's a New Democrats promise. Two years ago, the House of Commons declared climate change an emergency. But we, again, need to, to be more aggressive on that. Consecutive liberal and conservative governments, unfortunately, have missed targets. And Canada is the uh, leading uh, contributor to climate change in the G7. They have failed to reduce those emissions. And yet another liberal government, I feel, would just do a lot of the same that we've already seen. We have an opportunity now in this election to push forward on some of the ideas, of course, that, that New Democrats have been bringing forward since 2003. I remember uh, sitting under the, the leadership of Jack Layton and talking about uh, an, a Climate Accountability Act at that time, and I can only imagine what we would have accomplished had we actually taken that seriously in 2003 instead of constantly missing the mark year after year. New Democrats have a bold plan to tackle climate change. Um, we will take that climate leadership building on the new net zero law that we helped put forward uh, by reducing emissions by 50% um, from the 2005 levels by 2030. We need to uh, reach those goals by eliminating fossil fuel subsidies. The Liberals have given almost now $4 billion to big oil and big gas companies and while building a pipeline and buying a pipeline. And that simply doesn't go hand in hand with their idea of climate change and accountability. We, we need to, of course, put in carbon pricing and carbon budgets and change the mandate. We want to change the mandate of the Bank of Canada to focus on contributing to net zero. Uh, of course, jobs have to go along uh, with that. They have to go hand in hand in all regions. And so with a lot of the green infrastructure projects and investments that we need to make, we will ensure that people will not be left behind, that we retrain, that they will be uh, a part of that, that zero carbon economy moving forward. Uh, we can create um, a million new jobs, good jobs, community sustaining and building jobs to help rebuild local economies um, and ensuring that workers are not vulnerable and impacted negatively by this shift that we need to make. We need to improve where we live and work this means retrofitting all buildings, all buildings in Canada by 2050. Uh, we will create a national crisis strategy to help communities reduce and respond to climate uh, risks. Um, we will create a climate core of young workers to respond to climate impacts and build an equitable clean energy economy. We will change how Canadians get around because improving transit and transportation is key to fighting climate change. It'll also create good jobs. It'll strengthen our communities, reduce our carbon footprint. Uh, we will uh, permanently double the Canada Community Building Fund, and we will help develop a public intercity bus program. Uh, we need to power our communities in a carbon-free uh, way. And to do this, we will set uh, that net carbon-free electricity uh, targets by 2030 and move to 100% non-emitting electricity by 2040. We need to protect our land and our water. Safeguarding that for Canadians is key. We will enshrine into law an environmental bill of rights, protecting 30% of our land, fresh water and oceans by 2030. And um, I was really proud to bring forward a national fresh water strategy as part of that to ensure that the, the eutrophication of our Great Lakes, the protection of the Thames River, uh, to ensure that the Thames is being brought into uh, back into uh, federal protective legislation. These are key things that we need to do. And of course, uh, in that land acknowledgement at the beginning, and I'm so grateful that that's part of, of these meetings, uh, we need to, of course, ensure that um, our Indigenous people are are at the center of a lot of this work. They are uh, often the first impacted by climate change. And so that indigenous knowledge needs to be incorporated. We need to ensure that we, we uh, respect indigenous treaties and rights. Uh, and of course, that's bringing forward and implementing fully the United Nations declarations on the rights of indigenous people. It's now law, but the implementation 
is the hard part. And that's what we need to move forward on. I need you to wrap up this last slide. I was, that was my wrap up. I, okay. I, I fought really hard for the last two years and I continue to want to fight really hard to ensure that uh, we have uh, an environment uh, and uh, a country that we can truly be proud of. Thank you. Thank you very much for sharing those plans as well. Um, so now we have a bit of time to take a couple questions. I've seen four or five come into the chat. Um, and Leah, one of the staff members at the London Environmental Network, will be picking some of those and then directing it to Lindsay or Mohammed. So I will turn it over to Leah. Awesome. Thanks, Skylar. Um, so we got some good questions here, which the panelists uh, can see, and we're just going to go in order here. So the first question comes from Robert McNeil, um, and the question is, the inter Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change report again highlighted the link between animal agriculture and greenhouse gas emissions. Do you acknowledge the severe effects animal agriculture is having on the environment? And if so, would you support ending subsidies to animal agriculture to tackle climate change and investing in the advancement of climate friendly plant based food? So we're going to uh, does anyone want to go first to answer this question? Mohammed? Um, I was oh, having Lindsay. issues with my mute button. Okay. <laughs> You'd Perfect. think after all this time with COVID and, and all the Zoom meetings that I would hit it faster. No um, <laughs> I really appreciate that that question. Absolutely. Um, our food security and our food um, policies uh, need to, of course, be be part and center to a lot of the environmental issues that we're that we're addressing. Of course, um, the fact that we need to to really focus on local food is key. Of course, that that impacts uh, how farmers are, are growing that food and are and are and are raising the, that livestock and and putting forward uh, a lot of more supports for small farms and and farming families uh, is key. But of course, that transportation um, and supply chain uh, issue in terms of it going back and forth across the border several times that needs to be addressed. And it can be addressed locally. Um, a lot of what I've worked on in the last uh, few years as a member of parliament, uh, I've actually had the chance to, to meet with, with groups, local farmers, uh, representatives from groups like the um, National Farmers Union. And they talked to me about the fact that the family farm is key and it hasn't been protected in the way that it needs to be. Um, often, the profits that a smaller or family farm uh, farmer will will get it's all eaten up by machinery costs and uh, bank loans and um, the fertilizers and the chemicals that are pushed upon these farmers. And that forces them to try and grow even bigger into larger farms because they need more profits to survive. Some of them are surviving only now on 5% five percent of what they make in total the rest is taken up by all of those things and a lot of the um agricultural companies are are pushing a lot more nitrogen based chemicals uh and this is what they told me and this is this is what they said that they need to and they want to work with the government to get away from uh so i think that in, in a short version of what i probably uh, would love to, to discuss further it's about that that looking at sustainability, looking at the local impacts, ensuring that we support our local farmers, ensuring that we have that food sovereignty uh, and eliminating the, the lengths of, of the supply chain and, and the, the, the mass transportation that's required uh, by trucks and transports that uh, we've, we've grown accustomed to and we can no longer do so. Wonderful, thanks, Lindsay. Uh, Mohammed, would you like to answer this question as well? Sorry, you're muted right now. There we go. So one of the things that comes to mind is the need uh, to recognize that uh, change is not gonna happen overnight. So as Lindsay mentioned, we do need to support our local farmers and local business. And when it comes to fossil fuels and the subsidies, what we also have to recognize is that we need to introduce or we should be looking at legislation that uh, addresses the needs of our local farmers 
but also looking at how we can ensure the impacts of pesticides on wildlife or how we can make sure that uh, toxicity, the, you know, we can pass legislation to address toxicity by testing on animals. How do we uh, tackle food waste, for example? How do we bring in policies such as the No Waste Food Fund uh, so we can build a circular uh, food economy so that we could also keep things local, not have to worry about the extra um, uh, tasking the environment by you know, transportation costs. But the reality of it is that also, uh, and sometimes we have to recognize that we can get our things locally. So we do have a, an, an economy that is also dependent on our relationships with our partners and on bringing things from other areas. So how can we lessen our, our footprint and make sure that uh, we are not adding to the, the you know, the environmental uh, uh, crisis that we're already going through. Uh, so these are some things that come to mind as well as, uh, you know, food security for indigenous communities. Uh, I think these are all things that we have to put on the table and address and make sure that we're listening to the concerns uh, that we can take action and that the action, while it may not be overnight, uh, it has to take into consideration uh, the right approach and one that will help us uh, achieve our targets. Great, thank you both for answering that one. Um, so we have like 10, just under 10 minutes, um, but we'll try and get through as many questions as we can. So this one is actually directed to you again, Mohammed. Uh, it is from Brendan Samuels. And the question is, what is the status of the Liberal Party's commitment to ban harmful single use plastics starting in 2021? So I recall when I was knocking on doors in, 2020, in 2019, that that was something that we wanted to start working on. And um, I know that uh, something called COVID did impact some of the um, initiatives that we wanted to put in place, but this is something that the party is committed to eliminating plastic waste by 2030. And um, this is something that as your member of parliament, I would be strongly working towards uh, ensuring that we can uh, keep the conversation going because we see it every day. We're seeing the impact that it's having on our oceans. We're, you know, we're seeing the impact that it's having on our local community. And I, I think we've stopped, talk, we've stopped talking about it. I think we were talking about this more as communities back in, you know, in 2018 and before, and now we're not talking about, you know, eliminating single use plastics as much. So I think we need to have those conversations and make sure that they're part of this, uh, this election and part of the platform that we're putting forward. Um, now, I do remember that we've also banned um, microbeads in toiletries. So the wonderful things that we used to put on our faces and in our hairs, uh, those are now banned. So there's work in progress. Can we do more? Yes. And that is definitely something that, that we need to consider uh, as we move forward. Thank you. Um, so I'm going to direct this next question to Lindsay first. And then can, can um, I actually answer the plastics one too? Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> for sure. Okay. Um, I uh, just put myself in there. Um, one of the things that I'm so uh, proud of, uh, there are so many, but uh, it was actually New Democrats who pushed for that microbeads legislation and we pushed for years on that. And so that was passed, uh, gosh, bef I think before about 2014, but that's because of New Democrats hard work. So I'm super proud of that. Uh, one of the things too uh, that uh, we want to do, New Democrats want to do in terms of that banning of plastics, uh, only six uh, specific plastics, I think are on that list so far we need to expand that we need to push on that immediately uh we also uh, need to ensure that those companies and industries that are creating the plastics are held responsible for um, the entire life cycle of that plastic. So whether they're using it in the manufacturing or packaging or what have you, they need to be held responsible because they are part of the problem. Uh, we also need to put forward legislation that ensures that we're not exporting our plastic garbage. Um, that's a, a key part of, of what we have to do globally in terms of our responsibility. I would also add that um, there are key pieces of legislation that we could uh, enact, like a right to repair 
uh, law that ensures that a lot of the, the electronics that use a lot of heavy plastics, in, in addition to many other toxic substances, uh, is put forward so that we are fixing that and that we have the ability to fix it instead of just throwing away a perfectly good cell phone and, and or you know car parts or, or computer parts or what have you, uh, that we're, we have access to that right to repair legislation. These are things that can help landfills as well. Wonderful, thanks. Um, so I think this might be our last question if you take one to two minutes to answer this each. Um, so this question comes from Derek Richmond. Um, and the question is, the Canadian Union of Postal Workers launched a campaign to make a carbon free Canada post. Delivering community power uh, wants to electrify its 13,000 fleet by 2030 and a Canada wide network of public charging stations. Uh, we have put this campaign forward to the Liberal government over several years without any success. If elected, I'm asking all the candidates if they will support and work with the Canadian Union of Postal Workers to make this happen. Canada Post can be a world leader in carbon-free delivery. Uh, we'll start with Lindsay, one to two minutes, and then Mohammed for one to two minutes. Perfect. Thank you. Uh, yes, actually, uh, I have worked directly with uh, the Canadian Union of Postal Workers uh, as the member of parliament in London Fanshawe to do just that, to put that forward, uh, to put pressure on the federal government to take this plan seriously. It is an incredible plan. Uh, the, the, not only the, the focus on uh, the local hubs uh, that can help the environment, the transition of the entire fleet uh, to electric vehicles, uh, that of course needs to be expanded on the federal front to all uh, federal vehicles that are used everything within that fleet. Um, of course, uh, we also know that retrofitting uh, can post buildings, uh, the depots, the local uh, um, mail service buildings that, that, that they, they have across this country, retrofitting those buildings are part of our plan as we want to do that by 2050. And of course, uh, <laughs> Canada Post has such a unique um, role to play in terms of that leadership, in terms of, of moving forward at that local level. And I think of as well, the not just the environmental impact, but of course, the community impact that postal workers can have. A lot of our seniors, of course, have have suffered from a great deal of isolation. And oftentimes it's the postie that they see every day that they can uh, relate to and have a conversation with. And so ensuring the strength of Canada Post and postal workers is so key. They've often been neglected, I think, during the, the conversations of essential workers, frontline workers, and we need to put that first and foremost forward. And so our attention on that needs to be fulsome in terms of how we respond and how we use this incredible Crown Corporation and strengthen it going forward. And over to Mohammed. So the short answer is, if elected, I would be more than willing and happy to meet and have the conversation because um, we need to ensure that we're listening. And when we don't have all the answers, we are sitting down with our partners and stakeholders and finding out how we can learn what the best way forward is. I know that some of the things that we're already doing, uh, we've committed to continue help Canadians um, you know, retrofit their homes, as I mentioned earlier, uh, we are uh, committed to improve the energy efficiency in the homes of Canadians. We've given rebates up to 5,000 in grants to retrofit homes. And moving forward, we'll make an uh, interest fee loan up to 40,000 uh, to help Canadians uh, do just that. We've also offered rebates of up to 5,000 to 100,000 Canadians uh, to have in, for those who have ch uh, purchased um, electric vehicles for charging stations. So uh, you can drive from St. John's to Victoria in an electric vehicle. We've also committed 100% of our vehicles sold in Canada to be zero emission by 2035 and supported automakers and auto workers to produce in Canada. So I think there's a lot that we can do and in listening to the ways uh, that we can do things better and build back better. This is certainly a discussion that I would welcome with Canada Post and uh, any other stakeholder to have uh, selected. 
Wonderful. Thank you both so much for joining us tonight for uh, meet and greet with some federal candidates. And thank you to all of the attendees as well for making time to listen to your candidates on their various platform promises. Uh, don't forget to vote in the advanced polls this weekend or on September 20th uh, and make sure that your vote prioritizes environmental action 